following is a paid program, and the views expressed on this show do not represent the views of WJZ AM, Intercom Communications, its sponsors, or affiliates. Get ready, Baltimore. It's time for some super slams and beatdowns. We've got the cheap shots and the clean finishes. Watch out for the chair. Oh, that's gotta hurt. <laughs> this is Top of the Row. Your Monday night wrestling show on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Now, here's the enforcer. Baltimore's own, Kill Kuda Jr. Welcome to Top of the Rope Wrestling Radio, ladies and gentlemen. You know who I am. You've officially gone live. I have so much I can possibly get to today. It's, it's one of those weeks where I'm upset I just have a one-hour show, I have to be honest. Uh, I wish it was a longer show, but have a lot to get to. I was meant to have... Linz from Turnbuckle Topics on with me, however, some came up. Linz will not be joining me. That's a shame. Don't worry. We'll have Linz on in the very near future. But the first thing I want to I want to do here, because this is my first opportunity to bring this up on the platform that I have. Because somebody DM'd me. They said, hey, man, how, well, what's, what's with the once a week show? And then you have the one YouTube. What, what's the deal with it? Well, I'll tell you why. Because I go live on this station. I, I am a different kind of podcast. And then I post the video later on, and I, that's, that's how I roll with this. So this is my first opportunity to talk about something that in the lightning fast news era of wrestling is a little bit of old news, but it's still a very fresh wound for a lot of people. Before I get to the big news that shattered everyone, let's talk about what happened on Saturday night. AEW Revolution. A fantastic Show overall, I would say. I think they did very well for themselves. However, I got to rate every match like I do. I got to give my my opinions like I do. If you want to jump in with your opinion, please feel free. 410-812, or I'm sorry, 410-823-1812. 410-823-1812. Give me a shout. Jump in if you want. So let, let's start here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to go in order with the card here. First, we have SCU versus Dark Order, which it was on the pre-show. It was announced very last minute. However, it is still very much connected to what the Dark Order has been doing with, uh, with uh, the angel, Christopher Daniels. And, and I have to say, it was pretty cool how they handled it. It was, it was a good enough tag match. I gave it a 7.5 out of 10. There were a couple spots there that you didn't really see coming. However, the big positive in it was after the match was over, because Dark Order did get the win, after the match was over, a hooded, a robed hooded figure came out to the Dark Order's entrance music, and everyone is wondering, is this the Exalted One? And then the figure revealed itself to be the fallen angel Christopher Daniels himself, and we were like, there's no way, and he ran down and tackled Evil Uno, which immediately said, okay, well, it's clearly not him. He wouldn't tackle Evil Uno if he was the exalted one, as the the uh, the myth and all of the rumors of who the exalted one is are being feuded or are being fueled right now. They simply posted the exalted one is near. Coincidentally, the same day that Matt Hardy's contract expired with WWE, there's a little hidden message in the picture if you've seen it that says "sitting in a dead tree." I don't know what that is. The only person who's attempted to try to break that down, I believe, was either Sean Ross Sapp or Ryan Satin, where they found a poem or something or a song that had that in it. I can't, I'm paraphrasing it too much. But there's a lot going on here. And Matt Hardy even put out a video on YouTube describing, hey, my contract expired. He, he put it out at midnight at the moment his WWE contract was up to let everybody know. But I'm going to get into that later because right now I'm talking about Revolution. SCU Dark Order was a good match. Good for them. I like the little Daniel spot. Cool. That's fine. Then after that one, we started the official show and we opened with Jake Hager versus Dustin Rhodes. And uh, I got to be honest. Other than Dustin forcibly kissing Hager's wife, 
R- really, really wasn't much happening here. I mean, they, they did okay. It kind of told the story. But Hager went over, which I expected. Uh, I, By the way, as far as my, my win-loss picks went here, I only got two of them wrong. I'll break them down as I go. I got Dark Order, and uh, I did miss the Dustin pick. I thought Dustin would win this match. I thought they would have him go over, because then there's a chance for this to continue. If, if Dustin, I feel like even though he would have gotten justice for Hager breaking his arm, I feel like it would have given it a chance to continue because then Hager can come back at him and go, no, I'm not done with the, with this old guy. I, I need, need another piece of it. But instead, Hager won. And so but the only thing that really happened in the match was uh, before the match happened, Jake Hager went to ringside to his wife who was standing there right behind the guardrail and he gave her a kiss. And I'm putting that very, very mildly. This They made out for a solid six or seven seconds. It was... I'm not going to say, I don't, whatever word you want to use to describe it, but not something you normally see, you know? And then during the match, Dustin Rhodes got in Hager's wife's face and he planted one on Hager's wife. And Hager's wife was upset and Dustin's makeup was on her face because, you know, he paints half of his face and all that. And she, she just screamed, that's disgusting. It was, you know, now let me jump in on a little conversation here. Somebody asked, you know, does anybody have an issue with it? With, with them doing this. And my response was, was very simple. There's only one tweet I responded to. Some of you were nice enough to like it. And that is, this would not have happened if Hager's wife did not also sign off on this happening. So I have, there's no issues anywhere at all. Like, you really think Dustin Rhodes would have just naturally done that and she would have naturally went with it? Like, look, I'm, I know, I'm sure Hager's wife is completely aware of what the industry he works in is like and how things like this can sometimes happen off the cuff. But I seriously doubt this was a completely unplanned thing, okay? The the only thing I could have said, and this is not me confirming it, it is merely me speculating as I said, hey, we're going to have you at the guardrail for a reason. Dustin might mess with you. We don't know what he's going to do, but he might be ready. Okay, cool, whatever. But I'm pretty sure they... They had that one figured out, and they knew it was coming. But the match overall, I gave it a 7 out of 10. It did the job. Okay, fine. It wasn't all that fantastic of a match, but it did the job. Then, after that, quite a good match, man. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm curious if you like this one as well, Hammer, which was Sammy Guevara and Darby Allen. Those two did very well for themselves. I called this a glimpse into the future, this match. These two young guys. We're going to see these two go at it again, probably with gold on the line on a bigger stage. And Revolution is a pretty big stage for AEW. But I mean as the company continues to build notoriety and a fan base and everything. Because I, I've written off the concept that AEW is a one and a half, two and a half year pop. No, they, they're in it for the long haul at this point. They have a very loyal fan base. It continues to get bigger because they're capitalizing on what a lot of regular viewers would like to see in the ring. And what I mean by that is the transformation from a storytelling type wrestling Uh, Not that they're not good at that because they are, but the visual of their wrestling has a lot more pop to it. It's a lot more dive oriented. It's a lot more spot oriented. And I'm not downing it. That's what they do. And they're very good at it. I applaud them for doing what they're good at. I would never down AEW for being spot heavy instead of wrestling heavy. It works. If you don't watch wrestling at all, and for some reason, the only way your TV worked was NXT or AEW, and you don't watch it, but you got to find something to watch that's entertaining, you would probably be more likely to tune into AEW. Because even if you have no idea who any of the guys are or anything that's going on, they're going to do a lot of crazy spots and dives in and out of the ring. And you will go, wow, look at these guys, this is crazy. These guys are doing stunts. Not that NXT doesn't have that, but if you don't have a basic understanding of how ring work goes in wrestling, NXT might have trouble bringing you in because after three minutes of wrestling, they're going to put on a rest hold for 45 seconds. AEW doesn't normally do that. So I think they've capitalized on that very well. But as far as Guevara and Darby Allen went, Darby Allen got the win. Good for him. Dude, this guy, I, there's nowhere for this guy's stock to go but up. Darby Allen. This guy's incredible. Great athlete. Awesome character. You can tell it's based on himself. Love the face paint. Love the skateboard gimmick. All of it, man. He's as Seattle as Seattle gets. That's how I describe him. He's the most Seattle dude I've ever seen. And Guevara, I think, is a great young talent as well. Uh, I think they both showed a lot. I gave the match an 8.5 out of 10. I think they did awesome. Go back and watch it. But I see dollar signs with Darby Allen, man. This guy is straight up money. And that's why... 
You see, I was always in and out on the debate on whether or not AEW needs a mid-card title. Darby Allen is why this company needs a mid-card title. Now, am I taking the mark or smark opinion of this guy's really good, give him gold? No, I'm not. But if you don't want him to chase the world title and he's this hot, you have a chance to make more money by having him chase something. And if you have him chase the tag team titles, that naturally takes away from him because he's partnered with somebody else. So if you want him to stay solo, it would be nice if he had something to chase. Now, do I think AEW needs a mid-card title at this moment? Not 100%, but there's plenty of young talent in this company that proves to me if they had one, it would certainly help them out. 100%. So those two did very well for themselves. Then we had the match of the night. The AEW Tag Team Championships. (sighs) Kenny Omega... And Hangman Page versus the Young Bucks. I gave this match a 9 out of 10. It was one of the better matches of the year. It's definitely a match of the year candidate. It incorporated the story. It was the classic AEW style. There was a little bit of New Japan Kenny in there, which I very much appreciated. It it combined everything that you look. But here's the biggest thing they did for me. It showed me that AEW realizes that right now their biggest money product is their tag team division. And they realize that. And you want proof that they've realized that? The Young Bucks have been in this company since day one, and they haven't held the titles yet. That tells me a lot. If this was a panicky, thrown-together, we-have-no-plan company, the Bucks would have been the first tag team champions. A hundred percent. Instead, it was SEU. And now it's Omega and Page. Now, some people were critical of AEW for putting them on Hangman and on on Hangman and, and Omega because they're not a tag team necessarily. They're, it's it's a very WWE thing to do. Hey, two great singles guys, put them together, making them a tag team. Let's see. Now, I think the reason the WWE does it nowadays is honestly to keep their notoriety up. For example, in NXT, we all know darn well that Matt Riddle does not need Pete Dunne to be a star. We also know that Pete Dunne does not need Matt Riddle to be a star. Neither of them need each other. However, however, it, it helps them stay in the spotlight. Put titles on them, have them on camera all the time, make them a big deal. And then eventually we'll release them back into the singles racket, and it'll be fine. But it's going to be a fun run for a while. AEW is a little bit different. For example, do I think the Young Bucks could last as singles wrestlers? I'll be honest. No, I don't. Could Hangman Page and Kenny Omega? Yes. Could the Lucha Bros? Absolutely they could. Could SCU? Maybe. I think Scorpio could. I'm not saying Kaz couldn't. But at this stage and what he's known for in AEW, I'm not sure. We all know Christopher Daniels could. He did it for years. So I'm, I'm just saying. The Jurassic Express, could Marco Stunt be okay on his own? Yeah. Could Jungle Boy be okay on his own? Yes. Could Luchasaurus be okay on his own? Absolutely he could. Now Santana and Ortiz, I got to be honest. I don't think they could go solo. At least not right now. I don't think they could go solo. But I'm glad that they made their tag team division the match of the night. They handled it very well. 9 out of 10 match. Go back and watch it. I don't want to explain it away too much. Uh, Omega and Page retained their titles. And there was a little bit of an elite moment at the end. They teased every possible heel turn they could after this thing was over. The Bucks and Omega were standing ready to give Hangman a triple super kick. Hangman was outside the ropes looking like he was going to buckshot Larry and Omega. They teased every turn they could, and none of them happened. So, okay. All of the options are open. But it looks like the elite is at least on somewhat steady terms. Then after that, uh, the poor ladies, man. I, I feel bad for Nyla and Chris Statlander. I do. Because they had to follow this. And not only did they have to follow it, and that's tough enough. If they put on a good match following this, it probably wouldn't have got the ratings. But they didn't even put on a good match. I'm just going to be straight up honest with you. 
Look, I like Nyla Rose. I think she's a pretty, is a good enough talent. I think she should have been the first champion in a first women's champion in AEW. And I love the way she put that reporter down in the post match in the in the pressers. I loved that, especially as a member of the wrestling media. Yes, if you don't want to tell me something, that's fine. That is okay. All right, it's my job to report what I get my hands on, and people can make their own decisions. I I I love that. Am I in the reporting business necessarily? Not really. I'm more in the opinion business. But I'm just saying, the wrestling media, I I do like how it seems like more and more wrestlers and companies are willing to give us the cold shoulder because they would rather just run their course. AEW has kind of taken a firm stance of, this is our product. You're either going to like it or you're not. And I think WWE needs to take that same stance. And quite frankly, I think they did. And I'll talk about that later on. But back to Revolution... Nyla Rose and Chris Stanlander. Nyla Rose defended her title. I expected her to do that. I gave the match a 6 out of 10. It it was okay. They didn't really seem like they were on the same page. It was a little... See, what I try to judge is, do the wrestlers have to slow down to accommodate their opponent's speed? And it looked like both Nyla and Statlander both had to slow down for each other. And it just it didn't really look all that clean. Yes, they were in a very rough spot. I will happily give them that benefit of the doubt. But even regardless of that, they they did okay. The match didn't even really do the job for me. That's why I gave it a six out of ten. So I okay, all right. But I'll give them a six out of ten. Nyla retains. That's fine. I'm curious who's next for Nyla. Then after that, we had MJF and Cody, which ended really the only way it could. I'll be honest. Now, look, the match had everything it needed, okay? It was gritty. It was back and forth. MJF got busted open. Um, MJF tried to – MJF whipped Cody with his belt a few times, or at least tried to, and then Cody got his big weightlifting belt back, and he was going to whip MJF with it, and the ref said, I can't let you do it. And Cody looked at him and said, dude, I took 10 lashes. I took 10 lashes a couple weeks ago. Give me one. And the ref just kind of turned around and was like – All right, I'll give you one. That kind of stuff, I'm totally okay with. I have no issue with that when refs do things like that. That was a very prudent thing to do. And it ended very, it uh, it was a good match. I think they they drug it out just perfectly. There was a lot of grit and stuff in it. Uh, Arn Anderson accidentally getting taken out by Cody. Uh, That was kind of cool. Arn trying to go after Wardlow a few times. Uh, Wardlow almost crippling Brandy Rhodes, (laughs) uh, but deciding better of it. That was a good call. Cody got his shot in on Wardlow during the match. That was all right. But how did it end? It ended with Wardlow slipping Max the dynamite diamond ring and Max using that to punch out Cody and get the win. So it looks like we are not done with MJF and Cody Rhodes. And you know what? I am thrilled that we are not done. Because if we were done here, like I mentioned a couple weeks ago, the payoff would not have matched. So, yes, let's keep this going, please. And then after that, the, the, the match after this was a pleasure, wasn't it, Hammer? Pack and Orange Cassidy. It was fantastic. I put out a tweet that some people agreed with. I'm glad that you did. And I just want to restate it. I said, I, said, I, I now officially disqualify myself as a wrestling, period, as a wrestling purist because I – I'm totally in love with Orange Cassidy. I I can never call myself a wrestling purist ever again because I love this guy and everything he brings, the comedy side of it. He proved that he could actually wrestle. Now, here's the biggest thing about the wrestling community I want to point out. I want to give the wrestling community a thumbs up here. None of us were surprised that Orange Cassidy could actually wrestle. Now, that's because some of us have watched his other stuff and know that he can or whatever. But those of us that are strictly AEW or mostly AEW, none of them were surprised because we all know how it goes these days. If you work for a wrestling company that has a network television deal or a big time cable television deal, they're not going to hire you if you can't wrestle unless they're only going to have you in the ring for eight seconds at a time, i.e. Mandy Rose. Okay, that's it. So the guy was awesome. Pack got the win, unfortunately. I gave the match an eight and a half out of ten. It was awesome. Here's how I describe it. It was a dream match that we never knew we needed and then that we didn't want to wake up from. And then the Lucha Brothers ran down and woke us up from it. (laughs) What in the world, Lucha Bros? 
What are we, really? This is your moment to mess with best friends in the middle of this? Okay. Anyway, that's what wound up causing Orange Cass- uh, costing Orange Cassidy the match. But it was very cool. And a lot of people were making the statement that Orange Cassidy should only be used for special attractions. And right now, I happen to agree with that. Just don't let him wrestle unless it's a big deal. And, and I think that could fit. I think that could fit very nicely. And then we had the main event where Le Champion, Chris Jericho, defended his AEW world title against John Moxley. That was a terrible impression, and I really am upset with myself. Sorry. If you're watching this on YouTube, I'm twice as sorry. That was bad. Well, all right. Erase that. But anyway, <laughs> we're live. You can't erase it. All right. This was this match was okay. It had a nice a couple additions. The you know the power the the power bomb through the table and everything. A couple nice additions. But Moxley won. I guess it was time for a title change. That's fine. Uh, I would have been fine with Jericho retaining. I actually wanted Jericho to retain. I picked Moxley to win, but I was rooting for Jericho to retain because I just wanted to see him hold on to that thing forever. But anyway, we have a new AEW champion, which is John Moxley. Uh, he's good for him. He certainly earned it. The match was certainly good enough. The build was even better than the match was. So I'm curious what's going to happen next Wednesday. That's uh, that's def- that's definitely the truth. It's definitely the truth. I got to let you guys know about Pro Am Belts. Use our promo code TBT15 off to get 15% off your next purchase from Pro Am Belts. We've been working with them for a long time. The turnaround time is fantastic. But the best thing about them is on their website, they have an as seen on TV category. So every belt that you've seen on TV, you can have you can have that one made for yourself. Use our promo code TBT15 off for 15% off your next purchase of Pro-Am belts. Then go check out Manscaped. They released a new lawnmower 3.0. They do that in every product you could imagine for men's grooming, especially below the belt. That's what I can get away with on network rules, guys. They sent us a nice little swag package. I've used it all myself. It's all fantastic stuff. And we can save you some money on it. 20% off and free shipping if you use the promo code TURNBUCKLE on Manscaped.com. That's promo code TURNBUCKLE for 20% off and free shipping at Manscaped.com. Also, check out Fight TV. If you are outside the U.S., that might be where you watch AEW Revolution. They give myself and Turnbuckle Topics uh, promo codes to give away for them all the time. Check out our Twitter feeds for that. My own, Champions Advantage, Lynn's Be Honest, Bearded Chris P, the Bearded Wrestling Podcast, Turnbuckle Topics, the network account itself. Keep an eye on all of them for promo codes from Fight TV. Go subscribe to them. It is more than worth it. NWA, Ring of Honor, Capital Wrestling, Wrestling from Hollywood, pretty much any wrestling you can imagine that isn't WWE. They've got it. They've got MMA, kickboxing, Anything you can imagine. So go subscribe to Fight TV. It's worth the money. I promise you that. When I return, I have exclusive material. From the NWA press conference for the Crockett Cup, I have interviews with Nick Aldis and Marty Skrull. Stick around. It's going to be fun. Monday night from 6 to 7, it's the top of the rope wrestling show on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Now, once again, here's the enforcer, Gil Kuda Jr. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Now, last week, the National Wrestling Alliance had themselves a little press conference in Atlanta for the Crockett Cup pay-per-view that's going to take place on April 19th at the Gateway Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And I flew out there to be a part of it. By the way, I want to give a shout-out and a thanks to Dave Lagana, who is the vice president of the NWA, for being such a cool host and such a cool guy. Thanks, Dave, for letting me be a part of that. Thanks for the invite and all that good stuff. Now, I did an interview with both the challenger for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship that being the villain Marty Skrull, and I did an interview with the champion. So, in respect of the champion, I was always taught the champion goes on last. So, without further ado, here is my interview with the challenger for the NWA championship, the villain Marty Skrull. Gil Kuda Jr., 
from Top of the Rope Wrestling Radio here with the villain himself, Marty Skrull. Just saw you give your statements at the press conference for the Crockett Cup in April here at the Gateway Center. And I have to ask the obvious question first. What is Nick all this in for, Marty? <laughs> well, I think Nick, uh, he thinks he knows what he's get himself in for. Obviously, we had the match last year at the Crockett Cup. And, you know, I'm not afraid to admit it. I came up short in the match. But if you watch that match and you see the, the aftermath and the, after the match, I was the one that was left standing tall and Nick was the one laying on the ground in a pool of his own blood. So, um, yeah, Nick knows that he's going in for the ride of his life. He's going one-on-one with the villain. Um, and, you know, I've learned a lot from last year. I've, uh, I've grown. I've matured as a, as a performer, as a professional wrestler. And the villain that Nick Aldis faced back last year at the Crockett Cup is not the same villain that he's facing today. So, it's, uh, yeah, I think Nick can feel in the air that his time as champion is coming to an end and <laughs> the time for the villain to become the NWA world champion. Well, now I have to ask about you being an NWA, you, of course, being one of the stars of stars in Ring of Honor. Yes. You're, you're teamed up with Villain Enterprises, one of mm-hmm. the hottest things going, and world champion PCO has been on my show himself. Mm. So I have to ask about Villain Enterprises. What is next for Villain Enterprises? Well, my goal in, in the first place of Villain Enterprises was to bring these stars together and have this enterprise. You know what I mean? It's, it's great for business. We saw it before, back in the day with NWO, with DX, and we saw it with the Bullet Club, which I was a part of, and now we're doing the same with Villain Enterprises. Um, you know, and I think it's just an exciting concept for, for any fan that comes along, like, you go to Ring of Honor, you know Villain Enterprises are the, you know, the big stars on the show. They're going to give you a hell of a show. They're going to give you an amazing match. And, uh, yeah, it's just a really cool concept. We've got the experience there with uh, PCO, um, the staple, and myself. And then we've got the younger guys in uh, Brody King and Flip Gordon. So uh, it's an awesome dynamic. Uh, it was really excited to have Villain Enterprises um, show face as well in the NWA. And I think that's what fans want to see. They want to see this cross-promotional stuff. Do you know what I mean? They want to see dream matches. They want to see an NWA guy versus a Ring of Honor guy or whatever the scenario may be. Like, that is, that's just generally good for business because that's what the fans, they want to see. So if they want it, you know, let's not let politics get in the way. Let's give it to them. All right. The last thing I have to ask is wrestling right now overall has effectively almost never been bigger. It's Mm. pretty much everywhere. It's on TV everywhere. But now that you're working with NWA... You're a big shot in Ring of Honor. You've got, it, you have so many doors open, and now we see Ring of Honor talent showing up in NWA. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Nick has gone over to ROH. I wouldn't be surprised if some of him and his buddies might make their way over. I don't need you to spoil anything for <laughs> me, of course. But I, so my, my question is, as far as the business as a whole, and you yourself officially as a top main event guy, I, is, is, there, is the biggest prize, quotation marks, in your sights at any point? I mean, that's why I'm here, fighting for the World Heavyweight Championship, is it not? <laughs> the, 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 the real World Heavyweight the Championship, real world as heavyweight far as we're champion. concerned, yes. Absolutely. Well, you know, you, you've to, you picked up on it. Like, it's a really great time for professional wrestling. You know, we've got some super exciting things going on with Ring of Honor right now. Like, I think the next uh, six months, um, it's going to be really surprising and exciting for Ring of Honor, especially with my influence um, and then the stuff the NWA is doing as well like it, you know it's like Nick spoke about in his statement today he today said they're over delivering and they really are I hear so many people say oh my favourite you know weekly wrestling show is the NWA and you think about the competition they're going up against you know in the grand scheme of things that's a pretty <laughs> yeah. crazy thing to say and uh, obviously New Japan's doing super well as well and I've always had a great relationship with them and, and, and love wrestling for them so when it came round to me having to work out what I want to do in wrestling, work out what I want to achieve still and come up with a new deal, um, you know, I was like, why would I just signal myself to one place? Why, you know, I want to make my own shots. I want to do, you know, the villain does what he wants. So I was like, okay, I'm going to turn up in Ring of Honor. I'm going to turn up in NWA. I'm going to turn up in New Japan and maybe a whole bunch of other places because like you said, the wrestling's so hot now, you can't just be part of one of you, uh, you know, just one group. Like I want to be out there and I want to be seen by 
as many fans as possible. So uh, no, it's a great time for professional wrestling. My aim is to you know is to help boost uh, companies like Ring of Honor, companies like NWA, companies like New Japan. You know, this is a a, a significant upgrade. This Crockett Cup venue compared to last year. Um, and you know, I feel like I'm a big part of it. I mean, the whole end of rails as well. And that's what I want to do. I want to, I want to get these companies into arenas, and then after arenas, I want to get them into stadiums. I want to get them on national TV. And that's my that's my goal is the general growth of professional wrestling. And I really feel like I can add a lot to the business. And you know, I'm in my I guess my prime years now, and I'm uh, I feel like I'm doing it. So it's exciting. All right. Well, Marty, thanks for taking the time, my friend. Marty Skrull, the villain and challenger for the NWA Heavyweight Championship. It was really cool that Marty talked to me, man. He was great. Uh, he was he was one of the easier interviews I've ever done. But the things I want to point out real quick are, number one, he said, I want to get these, these companies into arenas, and then I want to get them into stadiums. And other than that, if you heard what he mentioned, that Ring of Honor, the next six months, are going to be very exciting and surprising. Now, remember, Marty has all the stroke in ROH these days. So that makes me very curious about what's going what's gonna to happen because I did see on Twitter recently, Ring of Honor's Twitter, that it's Supercard of Honor that Flip Gordon is going to be challenging for the Ring of Honor World Heavyweight Championship. The thing is, we don't know who it is. Now, of course, you, I, I mentioned that PCO was the world champion. Well, at the time, he was. PCO is not the world champion anymore. He lost it to Roosh at their event last night. So, or not last night, the night before last. I'll talk about that later on. I have a full breakdown of it. So in the true traditional fashion, I said the champion would go on last. After I talked to Marty, I talked to Nick Aldis, the world, the world heavyweight champion in NWA. And here's my interview with Nick Aldis. Gil Kuda Jr. here with the real world's champion, Nick Aldis. I thought I would get to interview just you, but I get to interview you and Sweet Charlotte. Uh, a nice surprise for me. She doesn't say a lot. I, <laughs> yes, not, not very talkative most of the time. I, I do have to ask, though, because I don't personally know the story. I'm sure it's out there. But why, why is the title Sweet Charlotte? Uh, I believe it was Adam Pierce actually coined that phrase. Ah, okay. um, and I think it's just one of those things that, that, that stuck. And, and uh, you know, we have a great relationship with Adam. Uh, Dave and Adam have, you know, go back. David Marquez and Adam have a long history. I have a great deal of respect for Adam and vice versa. So, you know, it, it's one of those things. It's just like a nod to that period of history because I think it's very easy to always reference Ric Flair and Harley Race and Dusty Rhodes. And, you know, it, it, but there, there is, there, you know, you, you, you have to, I believe, tip your hat to every generation that has carried on the legacy, you know, because while, yes, when I, when I took on the mantle, it was... You know, not in the greatest state, and I had to. Think that that's and that's a great uh, piece of professional pride for me to have been able to restore it. You know, uh, it doesn't take away from the fact that everyone had done their part. You know, regardless of how much attention it got. All right. Well, the next thing I have to ask, and I asked Marty the same thing, mm-hmm. so I want to hear the same answer. What, what is Marty in for in April? Well, look, <clears throat> if you saw the Crockett Cup 2019, and I'm. Um, pretty confident in saying that if you didn't it will at some point be released prior to this event so you can go back and see it for free it was a bloodbath you know and it was my blood and I think I think sometimes people look at me and they see the the size the presentation the athleticism and they wonder in their mind like is he tough though you know is he like he looks good and he does it but but you know, can he bang? You know, is he is he when when the going gets tough? Can he really? Can he take it? Can he go? You know, and I pulled it out, and that's on. You know, the credit goes to him. He he took it to me and took it. You know, took me as close to the limit as you can take me without beating me. Um, but I pulled it out. The difference is is that this time around. I don't have that same level of gamesmanship in my mind. Um, This time I'm a little bit pissed off. And having done everything I've done, now I see his challenge to me as him trying to take everything I've worked for. Whereas before... I understood that he was the right guy, and it was and it was the and it was the right thing to do, and the best made the best man win, and whoever was to win 
would carry the would carry the mantle and carry it forward. Now things are a little different because I don't believe that he needed to be in this position at this point in time because professionally we're both riding pretty high, and he basically made the made the decision to throw that away and say, "Oh, I want everything, mm-hmm. and I want it, and I, I want to take it from you." I said, "Okay." And your plan and appear, your come plan and, appears to be to attempt to take everything back from him. Come and take it. Come and try. But in the, I just hope that he can deal with the ramifications. Because my question to you is, when Marty Skrull doesn't beat me for the World Championship, where does that leave him? And where does it leave Ring of Honor, having written this big check? Mm. You know? Well, I, that's effectively my local promotion, so I... Mm. Well, I hope they've got a plan in place. <laughs> Nick is coming for everything we have in Baltimore. It's official. Baltimore so. is NWA country. Don't get <laughs> Do you hear those people when I walked out at the UMBC? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, right. I, I, absolutely, man. So my next question is about Strictly Business, and you're working with the Wild Cards and Camille. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm curious, how did Strictly Business come to be? Well, after our first uh, pay-per-view in the power era. Guess who showed up and wanted to get a piece of the spotlight? My good friend, Marty Skrull. So, he aligned himself with Brody King, PCO, and now Flip Gordon. Well, here's my question to you. Do you really think that any three of those guys need to be part of the group with Marty Skrull? Mm-hmm. No. I was expecting an answer there. That's, well, that's an interesting thought. Right. It's an interesting so thought. So what is it that, about that group that makes it necessary? It's the fact that Marty gets to insulate himself, and if they're on his team, he doesn't have to face them. Okay? Oof. Now, he aligned himself with the best talent that company has to offer, to protect himself and to strengthen his position. I realized that if I was going to be able to protect my turf and my situation, I wasn't getting the institutional support from Billy. So I said, I guess it's time for me to make my own team. You know, I had Camille as an insurance policy. I handpicked her and she's become one of the most compelling personalities in professional wrestling. I know what I'm looking at. I have a good eye for this stuff. And when it comes to Tom and Royce, Tom and I have been best friends for well over a decade. He was the best man at my wedding. Mm -hmm. So there's trust there. That's really what it's all about. When you get to a certain level, you need a team, you know? And and we are are thick as thieves. And, And the reason we're called Strictly Business is because Every, we've, we, this, we formed an act to protect our interest as an enterprise. We are strictly business. Mm. Well, yeah, no, I, it's an interesting thought you brought up. Do those three need to be around Marty? I did not think of that until you brought it up. Nick, all this is raising questions more than me. How about that? I like it. I, I enjoy don't it. think you should be surprised by that. You're looking <laughs> I'm, at the most I, cerebral professional wrestler in the world today. <laughs> I'm not surprised by anything you do. By anything you do, Mr. Aldis, please. Well, I'm glad Tr- to hear Trust it. me. So my, my last question to you is this. Crockett Cup in April, coming here to the Gateway Center. I plan to be here. I mean, isn't, this a, isn't this a fantastic it's, venue? It's an awesome building, man. Unbelievable. It really is. It's, it's a great spot to be. So my question is, outside of you and Marty... What, uh, what, what else does your brand have on tap for us, potentially? I don't need to spoil anything, but sure. you know. No, I think it actually, um, I, I, there's nothing I can talk about as of this moment, because nothing is, nothing is official yet, nothing is in black and white, but I think it's, I've, got some very, I've got a very exciting, and I hate to be that person that says, oh, I've got stuff in the pipeline, but currently working on something pretty exciting uh, from a, a broadcast perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and... As a professional, you know, as a, as a, as a pro wrestler, this is my, which will always, you know, while I'm active, will always be first and foremost. I intend to continue to level up, you know, and whether and then the next step is this. It's, you know, it's a brand new arena. We intend to fill it. 
and I intend to prove at the end of the night why I am the driving force of the new NWA and why the NWA is the place where people should be putting their money. Yeah, well, I, I certainly look forward to it. The world heavyweight champion, Nick Aldis from the National Wrestling Alliance. So you see, that there you go. I, I flew out on a moment's notice to Atlanta to go to a press conference that was a total of 35 minutes long. And I brought those interviews back so you guys could hear from the champ and the challenger at the Crockett Cup. By the way, just to refresh, that is April 19th at the Gateway Center Arena in Atlanta. I plan to be there. I highly suggest that you make the trip. If you don't want to make the trip, I am more I am certain it will be available on Fight TV and on a ton of other platforms. And Nick even mentioned he has plans to do something in broadcasting. At least maybe for for the promotion or himself, I'm not sure. But it looks like we are in for a heck of a main event. It looks like we're in for a heck of a show. I can't wait for it. It was a pleasure to go out and do that for you guys. And if I may just take this quick moment, it was just an awesome experience for myself. It was really cool to be a part of that. So thanks again to the villain Marty Skrull and the real world's heavyweight champion, Nick Aldis, the national treasure, the man of a million nicknames, who isn't afraid to challenge me in my own interview. And I loved it. It was fantastic. I also want to go on record and say I am legitimately intimidated by Nick Aldis. (laughs) Standing four feet away, standing a foot away from him, I am legitimately afraid of Nick Aldis, and I am not ashamed to say that. I'm a little bit afraid of Marty, too. I got to be honest. Also, Marty, props to you for keeping the Ray Bans on all day. Loved it. Never broke it. Loved the suit. So, those are my interviews for you guys. I hope you really enjoyed it. But when I return, I'm going to give you my finally my reaction to Goldberg beating the fiend not to mention Matt Hardy is a free agent and Ring of Honor had a couple shows this weekend stick around it's gonna be fun every Monday night from 6 to 7 it's the top of the rope wrestling show on CBS Sports Radio 1300 now once again Here's the enforcer, Gil Kuda Jr. Hey, this is a national treasure and the real world's heavyweight wrestling champion, Nick Aldis, and you're listening to Turnbuckle Topics. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Say, say, I'm getting introduced by a world champion. How cool is that? Nick is the man, I have to say. Nick was just fantastic. And perhaps the best dressed human being on the planet. With all due respect to Marty Skrull. And myself. I look pretty snazzy at this press conference myself. I gotta be honest. I put forth a pretty good effort. But anyway. To move on to a show that got a lot of people angry. And I kind of gotta speed through it here. Because I have so much I gotta get to. And that is Super Showdown. On the 22nd, uh, 27th of February. In Saudi Arabia. So... Uh, let, let's make this quick here. Uh, Angel Garza and Humberto Carrillo had a match. Not sure why, but it was okay. Seven and a half out of ten. Garza won. Great. Mansoor had a match against Ziggler, and he won again. Look, dude, put this guy Mansoor somewhere else, okay? He, he can't just be the gimmick for the Saudi shows because he's from Saudi Arabia. We, we can't be doing this. I think he's a great talent. He's a real deal. Give him a shot. The OC beat the Viking Raiders because apparently the only place the OC ever wins is in Saudi Arabia. Then we had the Tawaik Trophy gauntlet match featuring uh, AJ Styles, Rey Mysterio, R-Truth, Bobby Lashley, Eric Rowan, and uh, yeah, there we go. R-Truth and Bobby Lashley started the match off. R-Truth surprised all of us and got the upset win on Bobby Lashley to stay in the gauntlet. Then Andrade came out and R-Truth er, somehow beat Andrade. Then Eric Rowan came out and R-Truth somehow beat Eric Rowan. And then AJ Styles came out and finally beat R-Truth. And then it was supposed to be Rey Mysterio, but he got beat up backstage by Anderson and Gallows. So he said, hey, if I win by count, by forfeit, I win. AJ said, I win the title. I'm the gauntlet champion. And then we went backstage again, and Gallows was on the floor in pain. 
And then Carl Anderson flew into the frame after apparently getting beat up for a bit. And then we saw The Undertaker step into frame. And he did his whole entrance and walked down and he choke slammed AJ Styles and he pinned him one, two, three, and he didn't even take off his hat and coat to do it. So the Undertaker won the Twek trophy and he looked at it like, I really don't care what that thing is. Thanks for the Saudi check, Vince. I'm out of here. And I, some people had a little bit of an issue with it that they made AJ look a little bit too soft and everything. No, I think this fit perfectly. AJ didn't see it coming. He didn't expect it. It was out of nowhere. He hit the choke slam directly. There was no build up. Why not? Make the Undertaker look like a million dollars. They can build it up. So it appears that the rumors of Undertaker versus AJ Styles at WrestleMania are true. And I'm, I'm okay with that. AJ could look under, make Undertaker look like a million dollars. And Undertaker still apparently has enough left in the tank that he's willing to go again. Then we had the steel cage match between, now again, these are not in order, but Roman Reigns and King Corbin went at it again. This time it was in a cage. Roman Reigns won. Are we surprised? No! We're just glad this feud is over with. Look, man, I like Roman, and I'm a King Corbin fan too. But this needed to end. Glad it did. Then we had a smack. Then we had a match for the SmackDown Tag Team Championships, where Miz and Morrison, in a surprising result, won the championships from the New Day. I got to be honest; I, it shocked me. I didn't see it coming. But hey, good for them. By the way, let me just say this as a fan: this whole "hey, hey, ho, ho" thing you're trying to get over, Miz and Morrison, quit, quit it. It's, it's, no, it, I, no, don't do it. Anyway, then uh, Seth Rollins and Murphy teamed up against the Street Profits and they defended their titles. It was a pretty solid enough tag team match. It was all right, but apparently the Street Profits are going to get another shot tonight. I'll talk about that in a second. Then Bailey faced Naomi for her SmackDown Women's Championship. And in a very cool move, Bailey used the t shirts that they were required to wear for this event. She used Naomi's shirt to get the win on her in a submission. It was kind of a cool move. So good for her. I dig it. Bailey retains. Then we had Brock Lesnar and Ricochet. That lasted all of two and a half minutes where Brock proceeded to throw Ricochet around the building for a while and then beat him after an F5. Went exactly how we thought it would. But now let's get to, uh, to the real deal here. Bray Wyatt the Fiend faced Goldberg for the Universal Championship, and Goldberg won. But not just, he didn't just win. He didn't just win. And I know Hammer has an eye for these details, so I'm curious as to his reaction as I say this. He beat Bray with the worst jackhammer I have ever seen. I mean, it was bad. Now, I don't know if Bray sandbagged him. I don't think he did. I just, I'm not sure. But anyway, Goldberg wins the title, and then The Fiend pops right back up and kind of stares at him angrily and then vanishes. Okay, fine. Here is my final thought on this, having all this to process it, having listened to a lot of other opinions, things like that. So this is not my original opinion. It has changed over time. Look, I'm okay with The Fiend losing the title. I'm not okay with The Fiend losing the title to Goldberg in a one-off show in Saudi Arabia. That's, That's my feeling. But you have to admit... If WWE actually listens to its fan base, they might have decided to do it, and our whining might have bit us in our own rear end. Because The Fiend was so hot that we said, you got to put the title on this guy, or it's a mistake. They put the title on him. Turns out that may have been a mistake. I'm very amped for him and Cena at Mania. I think their build-up to it is going to be incredible. And Reigns, Goldberg, it's going to be what it's going to be. Okay? It's going to be what it's going to be. I hope it does not main event. If anything should main event, let it be Drew and Brock, please. But I, I don't want Goldberg and Roman to main event the whole thing. I, that's but. By the way, I did rate all the matches really quickly. And uh, because I rated this as I was watching it, and I was a really mad fan of Bray Wyatt, I gave Wyatt and Goldberg a 0 out of 10. But if you go and watch the actual match, it kind of deserved it. It was just terrible. So that is my short-ish opinion on that. Ring of Honor had its two shows this weekend. Okay, fine. Bound by Honor happened first. Uh, just I'm just going to give a quick synopsis here. 
Uh, Jeff Cobb and friend of the show, Dan Moff, lost to the Briscoes. That's a shame. Marty Skrull got a win in a triple threat match against Bandito and Slex, who if you don't know who he is, please go check him out. He's, uh, he's certainly got a bright future for himself. Then uh, Nicole Savoy beat Angelina Love in a pretty good women's match that they gave a lot of time to. It was certainly worth it. And PCO defended his title that night against Dragon Lee. However, the next night at Gateway to Honor, PCO lost his world championship to Roosh. Uh, and it was in a triple threat match with Roosh and Mark Haskins. Roosh came out on top. So we have a new Ring of Honor World Heavyweight Champion. Gresham and Lethal defended their tag titles again. Dragon Lee defended his ROH tag title against Dak Draper. Bully Ray came out and cut a promo on everybody. Caprice Coleman tried to stop him. Bully beat up Caprice and the two young guys who tried to come and help Caprice, that being Cheeseburger and Eli Isom. So Bully is still on top there. Uh, then there was a fatal four-way. Dayton Cole, uh, Dalton Castle won it against Jeff Cobb, Tracy Williams, and Kenny King. Uh, Angelina Love won again, this time against Session Moth Marina. Or I'm sorry, Martina. Then uh, The Righteous, who are a very interesting tag team. They got a win for themselves. Dan Moff beat Alex Shelley in a good one-on-one match. And Villain Enterprise opened that show with a win over Briscoes and Slex in a six-man tag team match. Ring of Honor is putting on some pretty good stuff these days. So since I am very much pressed for time here, I have to say Matt Hardy is a free agent. Here is my opinion on this. I don't know where he's going to go, but what's kind of getting on my nerves is how a lot of really, really hardcore AEW fans are going, you know, Matt Hardy's like, I'm going to let my contract expire. He's going to AEW. I don't know where I'm going to go. I got to look at my options. He's going to AEW. I'll let you guys know. Check in for the next episode. It'll be great. He's going to AEW. Guys. The solution to every vacant of a company wrestler's problem is not go to AEW, okay? It's different for everybody. Wherever Matt ends up, he's going to be great, okay? Like, let's just be honest. People think he's the exalted one. Some people think it's Brody Lee. Who knows? I'll wait and see. But Matt is just fine. Couldn't be in a better spot. Real quick for uh, Elimination Chamber, there are only three matches announced that are the two chambers, uh, the tag team chamber for uh, the SmackDown titles and then the women's chamber where the winner gets becky lynch at wrestlemania all signs point to Shayna baszler winning so i will say that Shayna baszler will win and then in the tag team one i do believe this is the time that they finally put those titles on heavy machinery i think it will be pretty cool miz and morrison don't need to hold on to those things not to not to mania heavy machinery would be would be a nice pick and then the last match at elimination chamber that uh, at least is on the card that we know of I should say, is a three-on-one handicap match for the Intercontinental Championship where Braun Strowman is going to defend his title against Shinsuke Nakamura, Cesaro, and Sami Zayn. I think Strowman finds a way to retain. That's all we know. I'm sure more things will go on the card as time goes on. Tonight, however, on Raw, Shayna is going to go up against Asuka. Alistair Black is going to face AJ Styles. I'm here for it. The Street Profits get another shot at the Raw Tag Team titles. Andrade is going to team up with Angel Garza against Humberto Carrillo and Rey Mysterio. Riddick Moss is supposed to defend his 27 27- 4-7 title. Okay, fine. Lesnar is scheduled to make an appearance and then Beth Phoenix is scheduled to give a medical update on Edge so we will all start taking bets on how bad we think Randy Orton is going to beat up Beth Phoenix this evening. So, Because <laughs> that looks like the logical plan here. So, uh, thank you guys so much for, for tuning in, man. In my last, uh, my last minute here that I got for you. I, I got to say, this was a crazy show that had a million things going on. Thanks again to the National Wrestling Alliance, Nick Aldis, and Marty Skrull for giving me fantastic interviews. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Please send me a tweet about it. I will be back next week with reactions to the Elimination Chamber. I will be back with reactions to this week in wrestling. So, this is officially it for me, guys, this week. I will be back next week. I'll see if I can get Linz on the show this week. I'm sorry, next Monday. That'll be fun. Enjoy Raw tonight. It's got a stacked card. A lot's supposed to go down. Thank you for tuning in. This has been Top of the Rope Wrestling Radio. I'm Gil Kuda Jr., and I'm out of here. Let-